If it didn't go as well as you'd like, there's a couple things you can do to add points to your test. Um, and, you know, also working forward in the future. Um, the first thing is if you didn't take the practice test, um, definitely take the practice test before, you know, the momentum test. Cause I noticed um, hands down, the folks that took the practice test, their test grades, even before I added the five points for the practice test, were better than the folks that did not take the practice test. I know I'm probably speaking to the choir today, um, you know, because if you're coming to the live sessions, you're, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But um, just if you didn't take that practice test, um, if there's anybody watching the recording, um, make sure you take that practice test before you take the test. Because one, it'll give you an example of the types of problems you'll see on the test and it'll kind of um, direct you where to go. And it also gives you, you know, it's just some time to spend studying. Um, and then also you get those uh, points back. Um, good question. Um, you get those points back on your test. The next thing you can do um, is, you know, what Allison's asking about here is the test corrections. Um, if your test grade wasn't what you'd like and you wanna get some points back on your test, you can do the test corrections. Um, there is a due date for the test corrections, but it's technically not until like the sec the last Tuesday of the course, like May 4th. I want to say it's May 4th, Star Wars Day. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Star Wars Day, May 4th. Um, but with that being said, I would recommend doing your test corrections as soon as you can. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, you get those points added to your test sooner rather than later. So you have a really clear idea of where you stand in the course instead of like, oh, well, I'm going to do some test corrections. It'll probably bring up my grade, but I don't really know how much. You know, you know exactly where you stand in the course. Um, the other thing is a lot of the concepts in physics kind of build on each other. You know, like, um, for example, we just talked about, you know, we just worked on conservation of um, energy. And now in the momentum unit, we're going to talk about conservation of momentum, which is, you know, very, very similar to the math. That's very similar to that kind of stuff. So um, if you do your test corrections earlier, you have that hopefully knowledge that you gained from doing the test corrections to carry with you through the rest of the course to kind of, you know, help you with the rest of the course. And the other thing is um, most students do wait till the very end to do the test corrections. So a lot of times, you know, at the very last minute, that last two weeks of school, I'm being flooded with test corrections. And so it takes me a little time to get through them. So, um, you know, your points get added quicker and you know really more clearly where you stand going into the final if you turn in those, you know, test corrections um, early. So those are those are the reasons I suggest doing them early. But, um, you know, technically you can't turn them in until like May 4th, that last Tuesday um, of the course. Um, <coughs> The other thing I recommend doing, because um, I noticed there were a couple, like with the short answer, um, and and not y'all in particular, but just in general of, you know, um, I don't remember how each person did on their test, because like I said, I graded probably 20 or 30 tests today, um, within the last, you know, two or three days, probably up to 40. Um, so a lot of a lot of tests in the past couple of days, and and the so patterns start to emerge, um, and one of the patterns I've noticed is there's like um, a couple things that happen when you don't do well in the short answer. One is that you completely run out of time. And so you don't get to solve them well, or you don't even get to attempt them. And so when folks do that, um, I typically recommend um, just spending a little more time with the content, practicing those problems um, as much as you can. And um, the reason I suggest practicing the problems as much as you can is because, you know, physics problems tend to follow a set kind of like formula or pattern. And so the more comfortable you get with them, there's only so many ways they can ask you, you know, to solve conservation of energy problem or to solve for the, um, you know, area under a graph. So, you know, if you're really comfortable with that type of problem, you see that problem and you're like, oh, I know exactly what to do. And you can start working on it where um, if you're not really comfortable with the content because you haven't worked a ton of practice problems, you sit there and you go, oh, I think this is a conservation momentum. Okay, now let me look at my formula sheet. Okay, now let me look back. Now let me, and and you don't have as clear of idea of how to proceed. 
with the problem. And so you tend to waste a lot of time and sometimes run out of time. Um, and, and not just on the short answer, but you may have spent a lot more time than needed on the multiple choice part of the test, which left you not a lot of time for the short answer. Um, the other thing that I see on the short answer is folks that turn in their test, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before the timer runs out and they've just not even bothered to answer the short answer because they don't know how to do it. And, and so those students, they're not running out of time, right? Um, they just don't even know how to do it. Um, but maybe if they did know how to do it, they would probably have had enough time to solve those problems because, you know, they turned in their test, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before the timer ran out. So those students, the, the solution is actually the same, is to spend more time with the practice problems because, you know, the more time you spend with the practice problems, then again, when you see those short answers, you're not like, oh, geez, I don't even know where to start. I'm just going to not even bother to turn it in. Um, you have an idea of where to start. And so um, that's also, um, you know, being more comfortable with the, with the, um, with the material. The other thing that um, I see a lot is that students will just like put an answer, like, um, let me turn on the annotations for this. Um, so for example, they'll say like 28 joules, and that's their answer. Um, now, if the answer is wrong, right, and let's say part A is worth three points, right, you get one point for having the right formula, one point for showing your work, and one point for the correct answer. Um, if you just write 28 joules, you know, um, and that answer is wrong, you're not going to get the point for picking the right formula. You're not going to get the point for, you know, showing your work and you're not going to get the point for the right answer. So you've just lost three points on your test, right? That's equivalent to three multiple choice questions, right? Um, that you've just effectively missed right there. But if you show your work, then maybe you pick the right formula and at least you get a point, right? Or maybe you picked the right formula and you worked it out mostly correct. And so I can give you partial credit. Or let's say you just write 28, you know, you, you, you show your work and then you write 28. Well, you're still going to get most of the points because, you know, you're not going to get the points for the units or something like that. Um, but, you know, showing your work allows me to give you partial credit. And I really want to give you guys partial credit because I, I don't like when you get like a zero on the short answer, it like makes me sad inside. Um, so I will do my best to find ways like, oh, this is almost the correct formula. And I'll give you, you know, like half of a point, or this is sort of ish the correct work. And I'll give you like half a point. But if you don't show your work at all, there's, there's no way that I can justify giving you partial credit. Um, so it's really, really important that you guys show your work as well on the um, short answer, because you know, I hate when you guys just put like, um, you know, like one answer, if say there's like three parts and there's like, you know, then you put like five meters per second and then maybe like two watts or something like that. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. Um, and, you know, if all those answers are incorrect, I can't give you any partial credit because, you know, all I have is an incorrect answer. Um, I don't know how you solved it. And also, I, I don't know really the best way to show you where you got stuck or where you made a mistake because I don't know, right? Um, you haven't, I don't, I don't see your work. So anyway, um, I know I just spent like, <laughs> I just spent like 10 minutes um, not even working out any problems and just telling you guys um, about the test. But um, I, I really, like I said, I spent a lot of time the past couple of days looking at those tests and I just want to give you guys some suggestions on ways that you can improve your test grades. Um, so in the future, we can, you know, work on the practice problems that way we have time to do the short answer or we actually know even how to attempt the short answer and we're also going to show our work that way i can give you partial credit um, as, as much as i can and then um the other thing we're going to do is we're going to do the practice test so we get those um, points back and we're also going to do test corrections so we can get those points back so we can get you know those um extra points on our test so <coughs> those are um my best strategies that I would suggest for doing well on the test. So now let's get to momentum. Um, momentum is, is very similar to energy and it's also kind of a weirdish um, thing. Um, and the weirdest part to me is impulse, which we'll get to in a second. And I know you guys talked about that in your discussion a little bit. So um, momentum is this weird P 
Um, and it's not really a P it's, you know, in the textbook or something, it, it kind of, it looks like this. Um, but it's basically P and I have no idea why they chose P for momentum. I mean, I guess M was already taken, but, um, but it's P equals mass times velocity. So the larger your mass, the more momentum you're going to have, the larger velocity, the more momentum you're going to have. So, you know, if we think about like, uh, an 18 wheeler and a sports car, right? The 18 wheeler is going to have a lot of momentum because it has a really large mass, which means that's why it's difficult for them to slow down. You know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to stop short in front of an 18 wheeler, um, because they may not be able to stop, you know, um, in enough time to not hit your car. And then if you think about a sports car, they may have a low mass, but they may go very, very fast, right? So if you think like a, you know, a NASCAR, those cars are going really, really fast, even though their mass is low. So they could also have a really large momentum because, you know, their velocity is really high. Um, and so those are, that's um, kind of how momentum works. So then we have the impulse momentum theorem. <coughs> and so this is basically saying that the impulse on an object is equal to the change in momentum. And this, this bothered me for a very, very long time because we have this term called impulse. And so I wanted impulse to be like a specific letter, like I, or, you know, like something like that, but it's not. Impulse is actually this, right? So um, impulse is equal to the force times, or times the change in time. Okay, so it doesn't have like its own little letter, um, which like I said, it bothered me for a while, but I'm just kind of like learning to live with it. Um, and so that's your impulse. And so the way to, that you can change your impulse is you can, um, you can increase or decrease your force or increase or decrease your time. So if you think about like an airbag, an airbag, um, you know, it, it, your steering wheel has a pretty small surface area, um, especially that center of the steering wheel, right? It's, it's pretty small. Um, if you think about like, you know, your steering wheel is probably something like this, right? you know, that very center part is kind of small. Um, and so if you were to it be in an accident and hit that center of the steering wheel on your chest, right, that's a very small area. And um, it's a very large, you know, all that force is coming in that tiny, tiny area. So what the airbag does is it, um, it, in, it increases the force, it makes it over a larger area. And also an airbag is kind of right, is full of air, it's like a cushion. And so it, you're not hitting that hard steering wheel on your chest anymore. You're hitting this like large cushion. So it's spreading the force out over a larger area. And it's also also kind of like increasing that time because, you know, the time before you hit something hard like your dashboard or the rest of your steering wheel is going to be reduced because your body's going to have to go through that like air filled bag to get to that steering wheel. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Um, and we're going to do a problem in a second where we're going to talk about, um, you know, someone gently applying the brakes versus someone, um, you know, hitting a concrete wall, just, you know, just hitting it full speed. Um, and it's, it's very, very different. So, so, um, in order to be safer in a car accident, you either want to increase that time or decrease the force. Okay. And that will change your impulse. So, um, you may have seen some of my comments on the discussion where I was asking, you know, is, is your airbag increasing the force or decreasing the time or, you know, those, um, those collision detection software, you know, that like oppress the brakes for you. Is that increasing the time, but in, before that collision or is that decreasing the force or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, okay. So now let's talk about this. Um, this is a, uh, a conservation or a, um, a conservation momentum or, a, or a, um, it's a it's an impulse momentum formula problem okay so um, in this one we've got a vehicle that is 2200 kilograms so that's gonna be our mass and we have I've already done this conversion for you because I didn't want you guys to mess with this um, we have a vehicle traveling at 26 meters per second so that's gonna be our initial velocity and then we're saying it's gonna stop in 21 seconds. So that's our time or our change in time. Um, if we gently apply the brakes and it will stop 
in 3.8 seconds. If we slam on the brake, and it will stop in 0 0.22 seconds if we hit a concrete wall. And so it says, what is the average force exerted on the vehicle when we gently apply the brakes? Now think about this. You can already see, right, the time, gently applying versus slamming on the brakes, that's gonna decrease the force quite a bit, be, or the impulse quite a bit, because we're decreasing the time. And then look at this, gently applying the brakes is 21 seconds versus 0.21 seconds, right? That's a huge difference, and a huge difference in force. Um, and so that's going to affect, you know, how much force you have. So um, we're going to, in this one, we want gently applying the brakes. Okay, so our mass is 2,200 kilograms. And our initial velocity is 26 meters per second. And our time is 21 seconds. Now, there's something also that they haven't told. Um, we need a final velocity, right? And But they didn't give us a number for that, but they did say stopped. And so that's kind of a tricky one because stop means a velocity of zero meters per second. So sometimes that trips folks up because, you know, it's, it's they haven't put a number in there. They don't say goes to a velocity of zero. They just say stop. Um, and so then we have our um, impulse momentum formula, um, which is our final momentum minus our initial, which is um, our final minus our initial right here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put my numbers in. And if I was really mathy, um, I might have done, what is it, the distributive property, you know, and made like M times VF minus VI, but I, I didn't mess with that. Okay, so this one's gonna cross out completely. So then we're gonna get our force of 21 is equal to 57, 200 Newtons and divide that by 21. And our force is going to be, well, it's not really Newtons yet. This is gonna be a negative. <laughs> okay, so our final, um, our force is gonna be basically 2,700 Newtons, which is, you know, decent, but um, I think in the next one, yeah, in the next one, we're gonna do the concrete walls. So it's gonna be exactly the same, but we're gonna do the concrete walls because I wanted you guys to see the difference and why it's so important to pay attention when you're driving. Um, because, um, you know, if you hit that concrete wall, we had a, a friend. <coughs> um, yeah, you can put the final. It's just saying basically like your force, it's, um, it's just changing in that negative direction. So you can put the negative there if you want. Yeah, that's fine. But usually we just say like 2,700. Um, so now let's um, do the concrete wall. And the reason I like this example a lot um, is because we actually have a friend and his sister, um, she was leaving work uh, really late one night and um, she actually hit a brick wall. Um, she fell asleep while she was driving and she just like drove her car into a brick wall and you know obviously she died but um, just because it's it's so important to pay attention there's so many things that can happen when you're driving. So, um, this one again, it's going to be basically exactly the same. You know, all the numbers will be the same. I, I didn't, you know, I hadn't actually met her. Yeah, it's, it's, it is really sad. Um, and it was so crazy. You know, she just worked late at night and, you know, um, 
And so I just, you know, I worry about you guys. I want you guys to be safe. So uh, maybe if I tell you guys all these things, um, you'll, I'll scare you into being safe. I used to make my um, face to face kids watch car crash videos um, the day before Christmas break. Um, that way they would be all scared and they wouldn't drive drunk um, on like New Year's Eve and stuff like that. Um, I was trying to scare them into submission. Um, so anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know if it worked, but uh, some of them, their parents would be like, oh, thanks for watching, you know, watching car crash videos because uh, my kid came home scared to death today. But uh, I don't think they're going to drive drunk or, you know, irresponsibly anymore. Um, so um, we're going to do the same thing here. And we'll see. We'll get this, like, huge. Right? And if you remember the other one, it was, like, what, 27, 23? So we're going from gently applying the brakes, we're going from 27, 23 newtons to 260,000 newtons, right? That's a huge difference in force. So you can see why that would, um, you know, what what do they say? Um, we had a vet once that would say that's incompatible with life. Um, and so, you know, you can see that that's, that's a really huge force. 